Today I'm going to be talking about how we can leverage foundation models for robotics uh, and kind of get the best out of both of them. Uh, to start to sort of like motivate, uh, I'm going to do a brief demo. So essentially right now we have a robot, uh, this is running in New York, uh, like right now, and it's got a language model that's essentially going to command what the robot's going to do. It writes code out and then the robot executes the code um, and it's like basically we'll read my chat and then put it on there. So uh, to start, I guess, Mark, what's, uh, what's your favorite color of these bowls and what candy would you like? Uh, let's, I like the green bowl and uh, what do you have there, Skittles? Yeah. So I don't know if you can see this okay. Let's can make it a little bigger? And, and then we'll see, and the robot says okay. And you want some Skittles? Sure. So one really nice thing about language models is essentially, uh, you know, they act as this like knowledge base of even like very esoteric things like the Skittles are tasting the rainbow. And you can see uh, the robot actually doing it is over here. And this is the robot's view here. And I just said I'll take Reese's. And it remembers from before that I just said which bowl is which, who's it belong to. And yeah, again, you get this like very kind of abstract knowledge that Tasting the rainbow means Skittles. You can also do things like, uh, and I feel like when we first started like playing with language models, this is something that was like, I don't know, really impressive to us that I can just say put them all in different corners and it understands that that means that not the same corners, it understands what the corners are, it knows what all the candies are, and it's able to like loop through this. Like, this was something that, uh, I don't know, about a year ago sort of like blew our mind that this is possible. Um, so I think it might have missed, I think it, because they're in the same bowl, it like, it put the Reese's on top, the Skittles, and then did that. So this is like one area that we're sort of trying to like fix is that sometimes this grounding between the code or the language model, the fact that it can't see things means that it makes sort of simple mistakes like this. And I'll talk through sort of like why this is a big problem in robotics and sort of like where we're gonna go uh, to fix it. So let's see, what else can I do? Um, the so something like put the M&Ms in the center of the bowls and this is actually like, so essentially this would just like knows that the center is you know the middle and then let's say, okay. So something like making a line is like also a somewhat abstract concept. It really like requires you to understand the way that like, you know, geometry works and, uh, and you can kind of, the code is maybe hard to see, but essentially it should output something. Oh, I missed the uh, Reese's because I think it's too far off the screen. Um, but what I wanted to do was put the Reese's in the initial spot and then, oh, I think it actually got the M&Ms in between the Skittles. So, and then the Reese's is like so far off that it's fallen off the table. But essentially like it actually understood like what's there and it wrote code to be able to do some like abstract geometric reasoning like this. And it's not like, you know, we've like trained this or shown it anything. This is just like falling directly out of the language model. So, um, and let's say, move the, the, so something like also like move the M&Ms down. Like, it has to understand that like the direction of down is, is like in the negative y direction. Um, and we show that updates and it's able to successfully move that. And then, and something like move them a little bit up requires you to not only like understand sort of like general geometry, but also that like a little bit is not all the way up, it's part, part of the way. And let's see if move. And then we can actually like get some sort of like memory out of this that it remembers that before it put them here. And so to put it back is just to recall like the last command that it did and then execute it again. So that essentially, um, I'm going to talk through sort of like how we've gotten to this point and sort of some directions forward that we've been looking at to expand beyond this to fix some of the issues like when it picked up the wrong thing or uh, you know didn't do the didn't do exactly what we expected. So. To start, I mean, this is all about foundation models, and the, the main idea here is that you take the vast trove of information on the internet, 
throw them through a transformer, um, and we get performance out of it. As kind of roboticists, uh, the fact that we get this like general performance without having to like do any work or like collect data is really kind of like magical. I think a lot of times this takes a lot of work for us to collect the amount of data that was just given to us for free from here. So we should really like strive to figure out how to use them. And these capabilities are sort of like shooting up, like starting from language models that were able to answer trivia or explain jokes. We can also now generate images. We can answer questions about images and do these VQA tasks. Um, and we can even like hear audio and directly like map it through a foundation model to get the text out of it. And the real thing is that all of these performances, like they're great as they are and they're like continuing to improve and improve and to become more and more general. Robot learning on the other hand has uh, historically sort of been in these domains. So like really kind of constrained environments. We have these like, uh, easy reset so that it can collect data, like it can close this, uh, these two bins so that it moves one thing from another. It's got uh, very like short horizon tasks of pick and place. It's got uh, kind of structured tasks and the robots aren't really moving around. If we're doing any sort of like mobile manipulation, it's usually like at a very limited scale. So we sort of want to, you know, put robots on this wave of foundation models and see like how much can we get for free uh, without having the robots having to experience the world from foundation models. And so there are some areas of natural overlap. For example, like the reasoning capabilities of language models are super important. There's like this, I guess, general knowledge that's in there that is important for a robot to act in the world. Uh, there's also a lot of semantic knowledge of how things map to each other, what order to do things in. Uh, these are things that traditionally robotics has really struggled with. But there's actually like a lot more challenges than there really are like areas of overlap. I think in some ways like other fields have been very quickly revolutionized by having foundation models be able to solve them. Robotics, on the other hand, has all sorts of challenges like just general grounding. You need to know what your robot is capable of, what the environment has. A language model can't see anything. This like, is sort of like a huge gap for, for them. Uh, interactive decision making, everything they've been trained on is this like unsupervised just internet data with no interaction, no making the wrong decision, making the right decision. Um, this is like a core part of robotics that they basically don't have in them. There's also really, on one side, we're all about like huge amounts of data. On the other side, we have not only low amounts of data, but often pretty low quality of data. Um, I mean, even the, the data that we'll, I'll talk about that we collected later, like it's, it's all like teleoperation data, it's relatively slow, it's somewhat limited. Um, so it's really hard to get this like expert data that we, could, that we got for free from the internet essentially. Um, vision and just general sensing modalities are, I guess, slowly getting better in vision language models, but have traditionally also not been an area of strength. And then finally, safety is like really important for robotics. You like can't make maybe the same mistakes that in language we might uh, might forgive you for making. So all these kind of mean that they're not necessarily like natural, naturally put together. And there's a lot of challenges in like open areas of research to try to do this. Um, so to first start, I'm going to talk about how we can ground these models in the world and in their environment. Then I'll talk about what just powered that demo, this uh, code as policies. Then I'll talk about kind of like steps forward for building foundation models or using foundation models to give new uh, knowledge to uh, robotics. And then finally, I'll talk about maybe training our own foundation model and what, what that sort of looks like. So as I said before, a robot can't see, or a language model can't see. So we sort of imagine this, this task that like, you're a language model and you open your eyes, uh, or you can't open your eyes, and you're trying to reason over the entire environment. Um, once you like, open it and, and you realize that I've asked you, I've said I've spilled my drink, can you help? You realize that what's in the scene are things like a spilled drink, a sponge, which might be able to help. And also I've got a lot of experience in the world of doing different things. So as we sort of like, go through, we see you know, everything that's like where I might want to throw that away, what the gripper looks like in the embodiment. And then also like in the, in the past, I've been able to do things like pick up these objects. So this is all like crucial to the embodiment. It's both what you can do and it's what's in the environment. And we basically want to like bring this into a language model, give it in some ways the hands and eyes necessary to make it do these tasks. But if we just take a language model out of the box and say, you know, ask it this question, it answers pretty reasonably, I mean, it says like, you could try using a vacuum cleaner or calling a cleaner. Um, it even like takes credit for the spill, which is like a very reasonable thing from a language model side, but not necessarily actionable for robotics. So one of the issues is like, these are 
again, not actionable. So how do we get the language model to speak in a way that robots can actually do it given their embodiment? And yeah, so you know, we want it to be able to speak this language of robots. We want it to be able to like actually be executable. And so the first uh, algorithm that I'll kind of put forth is uh, called SACAN. And the idea is essentially, instead of letting the language model, where normally it would just generate sort of like the max probability next token, um, we are instead going to fix the way that it can respond. So these are like the only ways that, that it can possibly respond. It's called like a scoring mode. And we basically see how likely is it to respond in each of these ways. So if I said like put the apple on the table, and we say like these are the things you can do. You can like find an apple, find a sponge, pick up an apple, um, and these are like actual probabilities that would come out of a language model. Uh, and you can see like pick up the apple is really high. So like, that makes a lot of sense. But if you then like open your eyes, uh, you see that well there's not an apple in front of me. I'm just sort of like in the middle of the environment. So how do we like bridge this gap? And one way we can do this is robotic policies usually come with trained value functions. And these value functions are the probability of getting the reward of succeeding at a task given the state, given the image of the environment. So here, we might see that the value functions say, well, picking up an apple is like pretty low because there's not an apple there. Um, putting the apple down is extremely low because you don't have an apple in front of you. But things that I could do is go navigate to places. This has a higher value. The like chance of getting this reward is somewhat high. And this actually is basically on one side, a probability that the task is useful. So like this like, low-level skill is useful to this high-level task. And on the other side, it's the probability that you can actually succeed at that given the current state of your environment and given the robot's abilities. So together, we essentially have two probabilities, one that it's, uh, one that it's useful, one that it's possible. And together, if you multiply these, we get like, the most useful and possible thing. So in this case, it becomes find an apple, which you know, makes a lot of sense. First, you need to identify it. So, once you do that, you can then update this prompt that's going into the language model here. And so now it knows, OK, I found an apple. The value function gets updated saying there's an apple in front of it. And so probably it picks uh, pick up the apple. This is, uh, so I mean, really, the, the intuition here is like given this query, on one side we have what's useful to do the overall task, what knowledge comes from the language model. On the other side, what's possible in the environment given the robotics uh, abilities and its knowledge. And what's really nice is we have this like interpretable way of looking at its decision making. We can actually see that um, you know, the language model is reasoning over this, the affordances are reasoning over this, and we can see how it comes to its decision. And we can actually like, which makes it like super easy to debug and understand. But here, if I said like I spilled a coke, can you bring a replacement? You actually notice that like it's it's kind of like picked up on the idea of a replacement rather than like before I said like I spilled my coke can you bring me something to help and it went for a sponge here it understands that replacement means the replacement for the coke it understands this sort of like uh, deep information um, and then the affordances tell it that what it can do is find a coke it can't pick one up and it slowly can make these decisions throughout so we have this like really nice sort of like interpretable framework and we can uh, I think we did like 70% of our tasks, though I think with a better language model we got this up to like 85%. So one thing that's really nice is we can basically just swap out the language model and put in a new one as things get better and better. Uh, and the other part that's really, I think, important is that this grounding here halves the errors that you make. So essentially, like robotics actually has something to bring to the table. This like experience in the environment is crucial for the language model to be able to successfully plan and command the robot to what to do. And uh, a quick video of this, like in action, we uh, type some command. Uh, I think this is like I spilled a coke and bring me a replacement and something to clean up. Though maybe the internet's cutting out too much. And as I was saying, like we'll see uh, on the right side that it pops up with the actual like, decision-making process. So we can, you know, as it goes, understand what it's trying to do, why it's trying to do it. It's all you know, in language, so you can actually understand it rather than some like, actions or something more difficult to really like, grasp what's happening. Um, and I'll skip forward in the interest of time. But essentially, it effectively, I think, yeah, we, we essentially asked it to do two things. We asked it to both like, find, like, throw away the Coke can and also bring me something to clean up. And it's able to like, put these both together to form this like, long horizon task and do a, do a task that takes like, a couple minutes to roll out and is like, truly long horizon and sequential. But so one issue that arises with this is I just like, 
had it so that I enumerated these, ver these skills and I like scored over these skills. But if you go into like a world like this, uh, it's pretty computationally intractable for me to like write down everything I can do. There's like pairwise things, like I can stack something on something else. And so SACAN doesn't really like scale to this like complexity, this like intra this intractability of the real world. So how do we kind of go from this idea of how we ground uh, and value functions to a more complicated world like this? And uh, the idea here in this work, grounded decoding, that uh, Wenlong actually uh, put together is that essentially we can, instead of picking specific scoring things, just like very uh, specific primitives, we can instead just bias it at the token level. So a language model is always uh, predicting probabilities over the next token. We can also do this with a policy. We can have that policy conditioned on some arbitrary amount of natural language. So just like put the, and then the, uh, the next thing, the next object has to have a high probability uh, in this scene. So we see that like the Pepsi is pretty high. The cake is also there. I think these are like little cakes, um, as well as like certain letters are, are visible. And essentially, we have this like token level uh, grounding of what's possible and what's useful. So this means that we can also include things like safety and preferences of the user and be able to decode in like a much more varied, like combinatorially complex world. And we can do things like uh, pack a picnic box and ignore things like the knife that maybe the robot's not capable of doing because the safety function can sort of like biases away from it. And so it's just like, it's a very general way to sort of like ground the language model in the world and the capabilities of the robot without losing the expressibility of the language model. Uh, we can also use it for navigation, so choosing like where to navigate and even the language model can trigger when it should be grounded and when not. So this is in a way like a tool use out of the language model. We see that uh, given that we wanted uh, some object, you say, I'll go find, and then when it gets to the object, it doesn't know what's in the world, and so it can actually like trigger that I need to ground this next statement. And it can look based in the world, in this case using clip, what have I seen in the past, and realize that like a Pepsi can was there and an apple was there, and then make its decision based on that. So I think the fact that this is like, this grounding is like a tool that a language model can call up when necessary means that you can really leverage it for very varied tasks. Uh, one thing that still goes wrong though is, Let's say, um, and we saw it in the, uh, in the initial demo, it failed at a task. But it didn't get any feedback that, hey, I failed at that task. It just failed that and then kept going on to the next one. And in the, wor in the world, we might like, get this, like you're trying to unlock a door and you realize you put the key in and it didn't work, so I need to switch to a different one. Okay, I turned that and now it opened. A language model isn't necessarily getting this feedback in these earlier, uh, in these earlier setups. So what we need is to have some like, inner monologue thinking of, okay, I tried this, did that succeed? What do I see in the world? And there's a lot of sources of feedback that we can provide. We can use object recognition to tell the language model what's available. Uh, we can use success detection to say what, uh, whether it succeeded at something and basically build this all into a real prompt. So we get some query like, bring me a drink from the table. We use SACAN to determine the next task. And then we go to the table, but the language model doesn't actually know what's at the table yet. And so in SACAN, it's gonna reason over all the possible objects, but without knowing what's there, it's very hard to sort of like blindly reason what possibly could be there. And instead, the object recognition can just write this description into the prompt, and then it's very clear, uh, you know, what should be done next. The robot can also ask questions, and basically in this inner model, I realize this is like an underspecified problem, I should ask the user something. And then when it tries to do something like pick up the Coke and it fails, it can even recognize that it failed and just try this again. So what it looks like in the real world is that we have all these sources of feedback and we can just build them all into a prompt and let the language model essentially handle this monologue of what's going on in its head of, okay, I tried this, that failed, what should I do next? Should I, uh, I think in this case we have it uh, try something and it fails because we like explicitly stopped it from working. So picking up a Coke can and then, but now the Coke can's not there anymore. So the bring me a soda maybe doesn't work so well. So maybe you should go back to the user and ask, hey, uh, you know, this didn't work. I don't see a Coke can anymore. What would you like instead? So I see like an orange soda and it says there's this, this, and we say no, that doesn't work for us. So it goes back to the planning stage and says, okay, now I need to find this uh, lime soda that we asked for instead. So this allows the language model to be much more grounded in the world by using these additional tools of uh, a success detector, of human feedback, um, of a scene descriptor. And in this case, it 
successfully delivers it uh, to the person. Another nice thing that we see is that it can even, it actually like terminates at the end. It says like, okay, I've accomplished the task, and the last thing that it does is, and this is like our U position, but it'll even like raise the thing saying like, okay, I've like completed the task. But there are some limits of what language can do. Uh, there's, you know, I, I talked about putting things in a line, um, but like this would be kind of hard to specify exactly how to do in language. It's not necessarily like the best format. Also, if you wanted to uh, describe the scene in language here, you would have to describe like the complexities. They're all bunched together, and the green one's a little higher than this, and the blue one's here. And so language isn't necessarily the best thing for this. Also, this one where we have to wait until we see something to make another decision. This uh, feels a lot more like uh, how kind of code works. And actually, like, code is this like linguistic representation of actions. It's, it's, uh, it's directly what we're running on the robot at the lowest level. And it has all this power to do, uh, to call external methods, to do any sort of computation, do if loops and while loops. And this like more complex reasoning, we see things like put things in a line works pretty like straightforward when you're writing it in code, even though it might be a little bit more difficult to enumerate in language. And most importantly, there is a like ton of data of what this is. Like it's sort of the equivalent, uh, I mean, even I think like the best like GPT models now start code trained on code and then are fine tuned on like instruction following and language. So code is like this really nice structured and we know it runs, otherwise uh, it wouldn't be there. So there's like a, a good signal that it's high quality. So it's actually like a really good fit and it's what we run on robots. So we should just use these language models to write code and essentially uh, run that directly on the robot. What's kind of nice is we can both use APIs. So maybe we have like perception APIs that can like detect where things are. Um, we can use for loops out of this. And we can even use the language model to write new APIs. So if it generates something like is empty or stack objects as a function, it can realize actually these weren't already defined and then just generate the next, uh, the next thing. So this hierarchical code generation actually uh, does extremely well to sort of like do much more abstract and uh, complicated reasoning and it does it all pretty much, uh, I guess, few shot but without any sort of training. So they've also looked at like every textbook that you've seen so it can do, it can write a full controller for something as simple as a cart pole. Uh, it can uh, do, it can understand emojis, different languages, all this sort of like falls out for free. Um, it can even use different cross embodiments or different embodiments based on the available action. So here we just list like move up, move right, move back is something versus turn left, move forward. So this is the way that the robot moves and then the code is, is able to immediately adapt to that to be able to do new things. So it's like really showing this power of, uh, I guess, what prompting can do, and especially when you're prompting in a language that's directly accessible by the robot. And we put this on like, I guess, two, three robots here with different end effectors, and like, the best thing is like, you could, I guess like, I really like these ones where you're like drawing shapes, because I think this would be like an extremely complicated control problem, but in code it's extremely trivial to just write how to do it. And you can just put it on and uh, like within a day have this running. Uh, and it can run like fairly robustly. You can also do very abstract reasoning like make this square bigger, move something uh, to the side, or write these like while loops and if loops that, that wait for things to happen before it makes a decision. Um, so it's a very like, I guess, powerful concept. But there's also, you know, some limitations of how well we can write things through code. There's a reason why sometimes we want these end-to-end -end policies, something like, going to grasp a mug might be very difficult to effectively write through code. Um, so instead what we wanted to do was basically what if we just collect a bunch of data, maybe not quite to the scale of foundation models, but as much as we sort of could and see what if we just like train a model to output actions directly. So uh, this is a paper called Robotics Transformer or RT1 and the idea was basically like a simple um, transformer architecture with a few things to make it efficient enough to run quickly on a robot. We tokenize the whole input, the instruction, the image, and we put it through a couple like efficient layers and then we go through a transformer and then we just directly output tokenized output. Um, we collected 130,000 episodes. Uh, each episode is maybe like 10 seconds long, over 13 robots. 
a year and a half and uh, 700 tasks to be able to get it to uh, decent performance. And, and actually, like it, it does pretty well. So across the scene tasks that we have, it achieves 97%, I think. So it's pretty near perfect, except like little mistakes here and there. And these are scenes like this, where we're randomizing which objects are there and where the objects are. But it can also actually do pretty well uh, with unseen objects, um, with unseen tasks, like adding in a lot more objects and like really cluttering up the space here and like progressively making it more cluttered. Changing the background to be, you know, almost exclusively the data came from this scene where it's this like gray tabletop, but we put in this white tabletop with a with a uh, wood wood uh, cabinets and have or wood drawers, and it like is able to still open the drawers and able to pick things up, and it does a lot better than any of these other sort of like um, other other approaches. So we tried like just uh, regular behavior cloning without a transformer. We tried Gato. Uh, which has like some subtle differences, and found that in general RT1 actually works pretty well, and most excitingly starts to generalize across things. But I think the the things that like may we're most excited about are its ability to ingest uh, heterogeneous data. So we collected again a ton of episodes on this robot in this uh, scene, and then we put in simulated data. Um, which is very easy to collect. And we put in data from a different robot from a KUKA that was collected for a completely different project. And we just kind of like made the action space the same and then threw it in. And what you see is first the sim data, if we hold out certain objects that's only seen in sim, it makes a massive difference. I mean, I think we get, yeah, like it went from like 10% success or 20% success to 85%, so like 65% more. Um, it's able to even like, do new skills with those objects that it hasn't seen before in either one. So it sort of like can cross domain transfer. And then adding in these new objects with a different robot also works pretty well. And we're able to suddenly pick those up. So we're actually like starting to see this like scaling. Um, we do see that it like overfits pretty quickly on the environment that we have. I think we had like 97% there and like 80% in the next scene, which is great for robotics, but maybe not the, the level of performance that we hope to see. Um, but it can ingest this heterogeneous data, which I feel like that's like the real like crux of what a, a foundation model needs to be able to do, is pull in data from all these different environments. So it's starting, it's starting to feel like, oh, maybe we can train a, a foundation model. But some of the, the big issues that we come, up, come across with is, so we fixed essentially the data, or we slowly lowered the data size, and we lowered it by either uniformly taking out data across all tasks, or cutting out like the lowest data performing tasks. So here we lose, I think, like 5% of data, but across like the tasks that are underrepresented, but like the more diverse tasks. And we see the performance drops really quickly. If we just pull out data kind of uniformly across the board and keep our, our diversity up, we actually see that like our performance doesn't go down, or at least not nearly as quickly. So really like diversity is the key to this. But diversity is sort of hard to get, especially for robotics. You need to have them in a lot of different scenes. Um, you need to, yeah, like, and, and also like scaling up in the one scene. So we have this like classroom where we just collect most of our data. It's kind of like a waste of time at some point that you've collected so much data in there. So we're sort of, one of the big things we're looking at is how can we like vary this data collection. Um, but the performance, so one way we can data, vary this data collection is that we can imagine that we were in different scenes. So maybe we've collected some data here. Let's use diffusion models to imagine something different. So this is kind of essentially what we've done here is we recognize which areas we've seen, and then we vary everything else that isn't important to this task. So it's picking up the Coke can, but it's imagining that it's in a kitchen. It's imagining that it's in a living room, in an office. And all this becomes useful data for the robot. And essentially, we've just used these massive diffusion models to be able to inject new imagined experience for the robot and give it this ability to, to, to handle diversity. The, the way that it works is we localize areas that are important for the task, and everything else becomes an area that we inpaint, which means we replace it with uh, imagined experience, in this case, from the Imogen model, which is like a foundation model for image generation. And then we throw that in as though that was real robot experience. And we see, I, after, this pay, after this one, I think I have like actual numbers, but another sort of like trippy video of we can replace even the thing that it was picking up 
so that it learns a new task, so it can learn to you know, pick up these objects, while also varying everything else in the scene, or not varying everything else in the scene, keeping the rest of the scene the same, and making sure that we're sort of like in domain for the parts that we care about. And you end up with this policy that is, oh yeah, and like we can act as though the whole time it picked up like a cloth, or things that are deformable, um, and we see that we actually like, are able to do this at a higher rate. I think there's a lot of numbers here, but the, the main thing is when we use Roseon, all the bolded numbers are when we add it in this imagined experience. It's sort of like across the board, it helps and it doesn't really hurt anything. So it's sort of getting like this free experience just from the, the foundation model. But I think what we really want to do is at like the lowest levels use the knowledge contained in foundation models for robotics. So the next thing we try to do is actually like train our own. And we called it POMI, which starts with POM, which is this like massive uh, language model from Google, and VIT, which is a massive vision model from Google. We put them together and we put a bunch of, uh, all the internet data is in there, but we also put in a bunch of robotics data and specific data that is like more useful for robotics tasks. So we put this all into this like massive mixture and then we tried it on a, a bunch of different tasks and suddenly not only can we do VQA tasks, but we can do task and motion planning. We can uh, manipulate things in an environment and we can do real tasks and generalize pretty well. So the, the way that it works is given some language model that's taking in a bunch of text tokens. We also train the VIT to output essentially like text tokens or some like co-embedding space between the two. And it can be images, it can be anything else, but you can see Essentially, the language model is just reading in these tokens as though they're all text tokens. And these other smaller models are outputting things that then go in as vision tokens or uh, object tokens or things like that. And we train the whole thing end to end so that it learns to essentially like recognize the text tokens and the image tokens as though they're all the same thing. And not only are we able to do sort of VQA tasks like and kind of complicated ones like given this image, uh, what's in there and answer in emojis um, or something like really simple like just describe this image. But we can also do mode manipulation so we can do say can but all just like in a single model. We can do task and motion planning and have an output, a real plan to do somewhat complex uh, sequential reasoning or, or tabletop manipulation. Then we, we also did just like language only tasking, not even with vision. And because we started with this language model, we don't lose any of the initial language reasoning capabilities. So, it can do math or write haikus or, you know, it's a very like general swatch of things. One of the most exciting things though is that we really see positive transfer here. So if we train on only like on the same model but only with this data and only this data and only this data, we get sort of like middling performance. But if we put them all together and we put in all the like internet scale data, all of them shoot up massively. So we, we see that they're basically like there's reasons to throw everything sort of like into one pile and it's, and even though these are like pretty different visually, especially the uh, like between this like language table and this and the SACAN data, they're extremely like diverse visuals, the action space is different and it's still able to actually like cross domain transfer. We also see that as we get to larger and larger models, the performance doesn't go down as much when we add in this vision. So essentially these are just uh, language only tasks and with an 8 billion parameter POM model, this is what it started with for performance and when we added in this like training, it dropped like massively, like it basically is a terrible language model at this point. If we go to a bigger model, it drops a little less and then as we get to the really large one, it essentially does the same and even on some tasks it got better. So we see that like, if you get to a really large model, it's able to ingest all this information without actually forgetting or like having any catastrophic forgetting of its previous knowledge. So this is like extremely promising that maybe we don't lose too much by, by doing this. Some, uh, some examples that I think we were pretty excited about or just thought were kind of fun of visual uh, reasoning are here. So it's able to do things like read off here, uh, the price of these items and then do math based on that to tell you how much it would cost to, um, to get two custom pizzas. Um, we're able to, I think like this one is particularly complex reasoning because it's a mix of like words and rules and so it's 
it's saying you can't enter in, unless it's a bike, but it has to understand that like it's saying accept, but then there's also a picture of a bike and emergency vehicles, and it's able to reason through this to recognize that like on a bike, it's okay to go through. We can also use multiple images so we can compare, I think, and these are like definitely not in the training set. This is like one of us went to, I think, like Marine Layer and took some pictures and said, what's the difference between these two images? Um, what matches? And it's able to like put this complex reasoning to work even over these like images that it's never seen before, uh, which is like very exciting, especially for robotics tasks. And then we're able to put it on robots, as I said, so we can use it to, on the same model, do these tasks on the right, and, and neither of these is it putting, it's not putting out actions, but it's commanding a low-level policy that's putting out actions, but it's able to handle adversarial disturbances, like here we like block it from picking something up. It's able to close the loop with the environment and um, repeatedly you know, recognize what it's done, what it needs to do as we manipulate the environment. It can recover to it. And it can do this all through the same checkpoint. So you feel like this is a real step towards doing this uh, kind of multi-embodiment brain that the, this, this foundation model for robotics. So this is kind of my last slide, but uh, what's next is we want to go beyond language. We want to continue pushing on this like visual language uh, domain. But we also recognize that there's a lot of issues with applying foundation models to robotics. They're really like not, um, perfectly mated for each other, um, which I think is like a robotics researcher is kind of exciting that there's a lot of areas to still figure out. Uh, but in the areas that we can leverage them, we should sort of leverage them as best we can and do so in like, in a way that makes sense for robotics. So things like grounding them in the scene, uh, recognizing constraints or using value functions and sources of information that we already had uh, for robotics, like, uh, and then, but I think like really at the end of the day, like what we need to improve are the robotic side of things. We need to, while language models continue to increase in performance and vision language models, the interaction side of robotics is still uh, definitely like the bottleneck of the overall system. Um, but we do think that like we can kind of move, there, there's a lot of really positive signs that like an embodied foundation model is possible. This positive transfer across things, this, um, this ability to ingest heterogeneous data between different robots from SIM um, is extremely promising. And the fact that we don't get catastrophic forgetting as we train these models with more robotics data means that we can kind of leverage everything that was there but still add in our own data. So I think I mean, there's a lot of people who worked on this, um, most of which are pictured here, but not all. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that's it. So I think, I, I can obviously take questions, and then we also have the robot running in the back end if there's like anything we want to try on that. But All right, thank you. Uh, I just had a quick question. When you were measuring the success rate, um, you mentioned that you had like safety precautions to make sure that there wasn't any kind of catastrophic failures. Like you would find maybe the language model, like you said, that you would forgive, but. Um, what was like the range of failures? Is it anything that didn't like perfectly accomplish the task? Or was there anything where the robot did something that was actually like, you know, left the place worse than it started? So, yeah, I mean, certainly like sometimes it like picks something up and knocks it off the table and then uh, in, in a way that's like worse. I think our policies are trained to uh, like terminate or have failure if they like hit something like the table too hard or things that mostly like could cause any sort of damage. So those are sort of like both baked into the robotic stack and then also trained into the policy that that's like, that that would be a negative outcome. Um, so there weren't anything that was like too terrible. Generally though, the, the errors I feel like were split pretty evenly between the robotics policy failing and the language model doing the wrong reasoning for what's in the scene. It was sort of like 50-50 whether it came from one or the other. But I think as like language models continue to get better, like it probably if we went back and like re-benchmark this with like this was we probably ran this a year ago, and if we did a language model now, I think it would be more on the robotic side than on the language model side. Thank you. More questions? Uh, yeah, a few questions from uh, the Zoom room. Ken, 
asks, what about monitoring force feedback teleoperation to teach or learn about force interactions? So uh, I feel like maybe I need more context on exactly what that means, but I think like, um, I mean, a lot of the data that we've collected here is through teleoperation, but it's always with a, or maybe it's about like improving teleoperation, but right now it's with an Oculus uh, controller that's like tied to what the hand is. And honestly, it like, our teleoperation is pretty basic and really, I mean, I've tried to like pick things up with it and it's like hard to do. Um, so I think things like adding in uh, haptic feedback would be incredibly impactful. I think. I mean, we see things like uh, the like recent like Aloha paper uh, where it's like a, just a much better controller and it seems like dexterous manipulation is much easier. So I think this is like a huge area that there's sort of poor performance from teleoperation that's limiting our expert data, which is then limiting our policies. Maybe, maybe as a follow-up, a lot of the tasks that you show are vision-based. In mm -hmm. robotics, you have lots of other sensors. Is there mm. anything you could say about what your thoughts are on, on you know, things yeah, like I think LIDAR, like, IMU, whatever. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of tasks that, like, not having depth in there is, and not having torque sensing is probably, like, a little bit limiting. I think the fact that, I guess the way we think about it is we're trying to push as far as we can in the simplest domain to see how, what level of performance we can get. If we were, like, a product trying to get to the best one, we might be, we might add these in. But the fact that we can get to 97% on all these tasks, this is, like, moving objects, opening drawers, putting things into things, flipping things over, knocking a can over, that like the haptics you'd think would be important, but we can still actually get to 97% through learning. So there's, you can get pretty far with images, and since they're available the, kind of across the board, we want to take like the simplest approach, but I do think probably closing that last 3% is maybe on adding in extra forms of supervision like that. Cool. Final question from uh, the chat. Uh, asks, curious if it's possible for many of these models to run on consumer hardware for smaller robots like an NVIDIA Jetson or something. 550 billion parameters not going to be practical for hardware of this size. So curious what the options are for improvement. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of areas around like distilling policies that seem to be relatively promising. Um, I also think like the fact that these are hosted in the cloud and there's somewhat minimal latency like the we can run a lot of these at like you know under one hertz and sometimes like five hertz means that maybe the uh, maybe the Jetson doesn't need to have the model running on it uh, is probably like the the real answer that it's not as crucial as maybe we expect there's probably some like really high frequency things and then there's ways to, to speed them up but for now, uh, the cloud seems to work pretty well. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> Can you elaborate more on how you're using teleoperate data for training uh, for image and text? You don't need that. Are you training the trajectory of those using a teleoperate? Yeah, so essentially each, so the, the, the full architecture looks like we just take the last six images and then output the next action that the person took. So um, if they have like some trajectory, we're chunking this up into single time steps where we just predict the very next action to take given those like last six images. I see, so there is someone controlling that arm. Yeah, so in, to get the data, we zone. essentially like, someone takes a uh, Oculus controller and moves as though they're gonna pick it up. They can also do it with like a handheld controller, which moves the robot hand to then like grasp the object. We then take all that demonstration data and turn it into single time steps where we take in an image and we output an action. I see, I see, thank you. Uh, thank you, Brian, for the talk. It was very great. Um, you mentioned that RT1 uh, outputs actions directly, whereas like Palmy outputs like decisions that a low-level co controller uh, executes. Uh, I guess like going forward, uh, which of these like two uh, approaches do you think is more reliable? And I'm also curious like how reliable is the low-level controller that Palmy uses to execute actions? Yeah, so uh, the level controller that Palmy uses to execute actions is actually RT1. So it's like relatively reliable as long as it's in like the scenes that it's been in. But we do see like good generalization, but maybe not perfect generalization. Um, in terms of like 
Right now, I think the reason why we split it this way is that most like the internet data that the language model has been trained on is at that like higher level. Like there isn't action data or things like that that are in the internet. I think going forward though, we're definitely like pushing in this direction of what levels can we train into these models and still get pretty high performance. And I think it's somewhat of an open question of where, where do you get better performance? Maybe the language model or the vision language model does much better generalization. So potentially, it's, it's, you need to find like the sweet spot and trade-offs between performance and generalization across the two. So I think like the, the small local model is probably higher performance, and the other one has higher generalization um, is like the answer. Got it. And I guess a quick follow-up to that is, um, for most of the failures you're observing, uh, is it at like the low-level controller level, or is it at like the uh, LLM or VLM level? Yeah, so I guess. Initially, about a year ago when we did this, it was like 50-50 across whether it was uh, the high level making a mistake or the low level making a mistake. Now I think if you do like Palm E or something like this, it's much more on the low level making mistakes. Like it's probably like 80-20 now. Um, and the, yeah, the performance of foundation models improving has certainly put sort of robotics in the, in the lower position of, of performance, like the, the errors are on our stack. Thank you so much. Well, if not, thank you again. Oh, you have one. Just out of curiosity, now that we have you here and have the robot running, what happens if you if you ask it to do stuff with objects that are not actually in the scene? Does it? Does it throw an error, or does it try something weird? So I think because it's on code, it probably won't do much, but uh, we can, like, hmm. what, what would you like? Uh, uh, an apple. Let's see. It says, I don't have an apple. <laughs> so I mean, it does have like this list of objects that are uh, coded in for it to look for. And I guess not on the list, and then that goes through the object detector and so the language model. I've never, I haven't tried that before, but yeah, it doesn't. And you can actually, yeah, I mean, it's, unfortunately I can't like increase the size of this, but this is like all the code that, that gets actually run to do it. And in this case, like the language model just took it, like it just responded without writing, without writing any code. All right. Thank you again. Thanks.